live with the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences in beautiful downtown Raleigh. It's Science Tonight. Now here's your host, Chris Smith. Hey everybody, welcome to Science Tonight. I am your host, Chris. It's great to be with you once again for another episode, a very special episode, in fact, of Science Tonight, uh, a show for curious people with curious minds who like to learn new things, hear from interesting people. Uh, Every week we gather right here at seven o'clock Eastern on the museum's YouTube channel and do just that. We ask questions, we learn something new, we meet interesting people, scientists doing really cool work. And folks, let me tell you, for tonight's program, we got one of the best. We got one of the best. And we've got a topic that I don't think I've ever met anybody who didn't enjoy dinosaurs, paleontology. That's right. Tonight on the program, we have the head of paleontology for the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, Dr. Lindsay Zano, who right now is in the field in New Mexico looking for dinosaurs and other uh, etc. <laughs> fossilized fauna. Uh, I'm going to remind everybody before Zan- Dr. Zano joins, uh, jump in the chat throughout tonight's program and drop questions for Dr. Lindsay Zano as we go, right? Go ahead. If you have a question, type it up, get those queued up for me. That way, a little bit after we learn about what's happening in paleontology in New Mexico right now, we're going to take your questions. That's right. So all of you tuning in right now, we'll get the opportunity to have your questions asked on air, but you gotta get them into the chat in order to make that happen. Or if you're watching over on Facebook, make sure you drop them into the comments thread because this one's gonna be a good one. Everybody, let me go ahead and bring on tonight's very special guest in a very special place, Dr. Lindsay Zano. How are things? Hey, Chris, how are you doing? Uh, I'm doing great, but I am not sitting uh, with this gorgeous landscape. Well, yeah, it's a beauty. It's been uh, incredibly windy today, and it's starting to get kind of hot out here, but what of you, right? I mean, it, it does the wind and the sandstorms, is, is that just like, you know, you've got to do penance if you're going <laughs> to hang out in these picturesque places? Yeah, I think that's true. We, uh, we had our first epic mummy movie style sandstone storm we expected to see like the face of the mummy like swirling in the dust around camp the uh, second night we set up blew our tents away knocked everything over made a huge mess right after we finished setting up camp so it's been pretty I mean relatively speaking pretty calm since nothing has blown away people's tents have shredded a little bit but uh, you know it's not too bad at the moment so we're lucky well, very, very nice. You, you said the everybody's tents blew away. Were you like yeah, chasing deer up a mountain? <laughs> well, we had some tents blow uh, across the valley, and um, you know we had to hold our tents down, our kitchen tents, our our base camp down for a couple hours. But um, but it was fun. We had uh, we put some music on. We sat around holding the the tents down and had ourselves a little sandstorm party. So it was pretty good times. Everybody, there you go. If you want to get into paleontology, you need a good playlist for the (laughs) sandstorms. Playlist is essential out here for sure. I I would imagine so, actually. Uh, Y'all have long days and you're doing pretty hard work. Uh, Tell everybody a little bit more about where you're at and the, the work that's brought you there. So this is our first stop on our summer expedition. We're out out for 14 weeks um, across three states, New Mexico, Utah, and Montana. We'll be wrapping up in early September. And um, mostly we're out in New Mexico and Utah because we're we're working on a project to try and understand how dinosaurs and other animals that were living at this time are about between the late early Cretaceous and the early late Cretaceous. So right around the early late Cretaceous boundary, um, how they responded to climate change that was going on at the time. So there was a lot of um, 
increase in greenhouse gases and rising sea level and rising global temperatures. There were extinction events. And so the dinosaurs were sort of caught up in the middle of this. And so we're out here looking um, for the different types of dinosaurs and other animals that lived here so we can help piece together that story. Wow, what a story to try to tell. Prehistoric climate change sending species uh, to the brink. So then why head to this location in New Mexico first? Well, you know, there are a lot of great places to hunt dinosaurs with a lot of incredible, beautifully well-preserved specimens. And then there's the stuff that my team goes after, which is the stuff that uh, <laughs> is, is not usually in the best condition, but comes from a time period where we know virtually nothing about the types of dinosaurs that lived here. So it's it's much harder to find specimens. It's much harder to find good specimens. But when we do, it's always something new. And it fills in a really important piece of that story to help us sort of detangle how dinosaurs were evolving and it's sometimes going extinct during this time as a result of all these changes that were happening on the planet. And so, uh, like, just looking at the landscape behind you, is is base camp down in this uh, flat area that's down below you? Where exactly are you going looking for <laughs> fossils? I wish base camp was down the hill below me. Um, base camp is many, many miles from here. The truck where we parked before we hiked up here is, uh, it's only about a mile from here, so it's not too far. Um, but, you know, we... we um, we work on federal land out here and it's kind of scattered in the San Juan Basin. So we set up a base camp and then we kind of drive as close as we can get to these little one by one mile sections. And then we get out and we hike to those sections and we can prospect around um, looking for new dinosaurs. And then we find stuff, we have to carry it back to the truck and then drive it back to camp. Okay, okay. So the, you and the team are actually out there covering a lot of ground every day looking for places to look for dinosaurs or are you working to actually dig up uh, fossils right now? Um, both. So we, we are still going to areas we've never been, uh, that the team has never been looking to see how good they are, how much bone is preserved there, you know, kind of exploring and feeling out new places. But we're also, you know, what we call prospecting, which is when we find a good place, the team goes out on foot and just hikes up and down the hills all day, just looking for little bits of fossil bone that are eroding down the hillside and trailing down the hillsides. And that's kind of the easy part. And then the hard part is trying to figure out where they're coming from. And, you know, I'd say, I don't know, maybe 50, 30 to 50% of the time we can actually find a bone that's sticking into the hill. But a lot of the times you can, you'll never know that bone has been out, out of the hill for so long um, that you can't find a record of where it actually came from. All you can find are the pieces. So, um, so it's hit or miss. Um, and there's a ton of bone out here, but what we're finding is a lot of it is very isolated. Like there's a, a leg bone here or a claw here or a turtle here. And then when we start digging in, we just see that, that, um, there's no skeleton in that place. It's just a couple of bones that have been kind of eroded out of the hill. So it's tough to find really good specimens. Well, so then why not go to some of the places where the dinosaurs are just sticking right out of the hillsides? And That's too easy. Too easy, Chris. You got to have it, a little bit of adventure in your life. No, I mean, the thing is that at this time, one of the reasons that it's so interesting is because, because the planet was so warm and because sea level was so high, there just wasn't a lot of space right here um, for the dinosaurs to live, right? So there, if there's not a lot of um, area for the dinosaurs to live. You need sediment to cover them when they died. And so you don't have a lot of outcrop to look, look at, right? So it's very limited. Um, so if you go to a famous place like the Hell Creek Formation, which um, is known worldwide and has tons of incredible specimens, there's outcrop all over the place. But the outcrop that we go to um, is just, there's just little bands of it. And so you have a, a much lower probability of being able to find anything just because the, the rocks of the right age aren't very common. So then are there particular fossils that you're hoping to find that would uh, give you more clues into this past climate change and these past habitats, maybe more so than others? 
Well, I'm always hoping to find theropods, Chris, because those are the dinosaurs that I love, but they don't help any more than any other dinosaur with this with this climate research. Um, what we have is a team of, uh, a collaborative team of geologists and um, paleoclimatologists and geochemists and invertebrate and vertebrate paleontologists and some botanists. And we're all working together. So every person works on their um, group of expertise, or if they're a geologist, they're dating the rocks. And so we're trying to collect all this data on the plants, the invertebrates, the dinosaurs, the crocs, the turtles, the mammals, the birds, everything, plus um, climate proxies. So like collecting sediment to understand um, mean annual temperature and humidity and precipitation and how those changed along with the ecosystem. So it's a big collaborative team and we're all working together because this is a really big picture question. So we need a lot of scientists to delve into it. Okay, well, that's really exciting. I mean, when we say, uh, you know, you're going to be calling in live from a dino dig, uh, and even in the past, we've done programs, right, where we talked about, oh, you just found this one big great thing, and you're digging it up in order to bring it back to the museum. Uh, but in this case, it's such more, uh, why, there's such a bigger question. And so you need even more kinds of evidence. How are you going to get all this back to the museum? <laughs> we have a big trailer. Uh, it's usually pretty loaded down at the end of the field season. And then um, sometimes we post when we're going to unload and bring all the jackets inside to the museum. And of course, the, the, the lab itself is behind glass. So people can see us, you know, getting ready for the field at the beginning of the summer and then returning with everything at the end of the summer. And if you go to the lab and look inside, you'll see a lot of our field jackets and a lot of the things that we've collected while we've been out here. So then tell me a little bit about the difference between uh, an expedition like this, where you're looking for fossils, yes, but you're doing this bigger picture thinking to try to put together past environments and ecosystems and climate compared to uh, heading to Montana to pull out a triceratops. Well, I mean, it depends, right? There's a lot of different research questions that paleontologists tackle. And I think the important thing to remember is before we can, before we can even start to address the question of how climate affected dinosaurs, we have to first find them, we have to excavate them, we have to clean them, we have to study them, we have to name them, we have to figure out who they're closely related to, and if that group went extinct or survived. And so what we're really doing is all the primary data collection, right, all the, the basic work that needs to be done, because if we don't even understand what lived here, we can't even begin to tackle those bigger picture questions. So a lot of what paleontologists do when they're in the field is simply try and discover what these ancient ecosystems were like and what kinds of dinosaurs and other animals lived in them so that we can begin to answer these bigger questions that maybe relate more to what we're going through today. Very, very interesting. Uh, what have you found so far? Anything particularly exciting? Well, we found a lot of great stuff so far. We found a really nice uh, raptor claw yesterday, um, a tyrannosaur dentary. We found parts of a horn dinosaur, ceratopsian frill. Unfortunately, there was no more of that when we dug in. Um, but most of the dinosaurs here are still new to science. A few of them have been named. Um, but most of what we're finding, even though we're only finding bits and pieces right now, are, are new animals. So we hope to be able to find enough to um, put a name to some of them. Just a, a minute ago, you were talking about finding bone that's eroded out of the hillside or that's eroded and then rolled down the hillside. How do you actually tell the difference? Or how do you identify, like, we should, we should follow this trail of bones and dig in versus a different one? Or do we investigate them all? <laughs> sometimes we investigate them all I mean part of that is experience it's it's being out here and knowing what what looks like it's going to be a good site and what what doesn't um, when it comes to recognizing bone though the interesting thing is that even though these are fossils dinosaur bone retains all of its original internal microstructure so you can still see the places where all the cells and the blood vessels and uh, all of the living tissues once were housed in the bone. So a, a, a fossil bone on the inside really doesn't look that different from 
your your bone if we broke it open and looked at it on the inside and that is very different than a rock it has kind of a spongy texture and you can see all that internal microstructure so once you come out and you learn you know you pick up a piece of bone and you key your eye to that um, you become really good at spotting it out here i've heard of paleontologists tasting rocks and bones i don't know if that's true or safe can you shed I don't know if it's this? safe, but it's definitely true. Uh, <laughs> a lot of stuff we do out here probably isn't safe, but uh, if you put a piece of fossil <laughs> bone up to your tongue, it usually sticks because like I was just explaining those spaces where there were once soft tissues are still preserved in the fossil. So uh, it's kind of porous. And so it will actually stick to your tongue usually. So that's one way sometimes you'll see paleontologists putting little fragments up to their tongue to see if it sticks so they can tell if it's bone or not. All right. And what makes a, a good fossil find versus one that you're going to pass on? Well, again, that does depend on your question because a lot of paleontology these days, you know, it's not just mounting dinosaurs anymore for exhibition. Um, there's a lot of molecular work that's being done on fossils. There's a lot of um, work on growth that's being done on fossils. And all you need for that is a small piece uh, of a good bone. So we collect a lot of things that we probably would have passed over a long time ago before we had a lot of these um, different kinds of techniques that we could apply. But now even a small piece of bone, even if it doesn't have any morphology and you can't necessarily tell what it is, could, could potentially be very valuable. So um, we end up collecting a lot more um, fragments maybe than we used to, especially if we're in places where there are not a lot of collections already made. And so anything we collect might end up being really important. Okay, very, very interesting. So you can you can bring all kinds of material back to the museum. Don't have to worry about it being one big T-Rex in that order would be to make nice, some though. pretty interesting discovery. <laughs> that would be nice. That would be nice. Yeah. That would be well, weird out here because we're in the wrong time. So <laughs> the wrong time. Okay. So uh, the rocks that you're investigating in New Mexico, how far back are we going? Uh, in New Mexico, we're working a, a whole series of formations that were deposited between about 92 million years to about 82 million years. So a sequence of rocks that cover about 10 million years of time. Right now, the area that I'm in is, is the younger sediment at about 82, 81 million years. And even though it looks, you know, like a desert now, back, back then, this was actually... Uh, on the edge of a seaway that ran through North America, splitting North America into a series of island continents. Um, and so this would have been a very lush, very wet, um, deltaic, swampy kind of environment back when the dinosaurs were living here. That's, uh, that's wild to think about. All of that space behind you just being lush, green, and humid. Yeah, so we're finding a lot of... Um, a lot of bivalves like clams and a lot of um, freshwater snail shells and a lot of coals and organics. So you can, you can see the swamp remnants still here in the rocks. So how do you know when you're looking at the rock, how far back you've gone in time? Well, we have a number of different techniques that we use to date the rocks. We can't directly date these fossils. They're too old for the techniques that we can use directly on the fossils, but we can usually date the rocks. And what we're dating are volcanic crystals. So if you can imagine like a molten rock and it crystallizes, that that moment in time, it's like a little clock. The second it crystallizes, it starts counting down to today. And so if you, um, if you shoot some lasers at it and release some of that information, you can actually back calculate exactly the age that that little crystal formed. And so we can use that if we have volcanic layers or we have reworked volcanics to get um, either precise ages or at least you know no older than this age. And that's kind of how we have to do it out here. Very, very interesting stuff. I'm going to remind everybody who's tuned in right now, we've got a great crowd watching. Uh, drop your questions for Dr. Zano in the chat or in the comments, whether you're watching on YouTube or on Facebook. We're going to get to your questions and comments uh, in, just, in just a moment. So Lindsay, 
tell me a little bit about just what a day in the field is like for you right now from from when you get up to the end of the day what's what's going on uh, so we get up around 6 30 we make breakfast and coffee usually we eat really well out here but most of my students say they eat better in the field than they do at home <laughs> they get three square meals out here so we cook up some breakfast we have our coffee we pack for the day you know there's a we have big packs we have 70 100 liter packs full of stuff that we need all day bandages plaster water um, tools all that sort of stuff and um then we get in the trucks and we drive as close as we can to the area we want to go. We do some hiking, usually, um, you know, a few miles to get to get to the area we want to explore. And then we hike around all day looking for sites. If we find something, we dig in for a little while to try and figure out if it's any good. And we take notes and GPS data and pictures and that sort of thing. And then we meet back at the trucks at the end of the day, drive back to camp, make dinner, unpack, log all our specimens and record all of the data for the museum's collections. And um, usually by then it's like 9 30, 10 o'clock. We sit around the campfire for a little bit and then everybody passes out and we do it all again for 14 weeks. <laughs> so, everybody, if you want to be a paleontologist, get ready to get your uh, 10,000 steps in every day. Yeah, right now we don't um, have any quarries in this particular location that we're opening this week, but next week we're going to have days where uh, it's all day picking and shuffling, right? Because you got to clear all the rock that's above the bone layer. All the rock has to go away so you can get at the bone layer. So that could be, you know, five or six days of 10 hours of, of picking and shoveling all day in the heat. So um, you can have some pretty rough days too. Yeah, I was... Uh seeing the sun like start to come over the hillside behind you a little bit I was wondering what I mean you mentioned sandstorms but is it is it hot well I like the heat so I don't think it's that hot but we did uh we do have stuff melting in camp um so it must not be as cool as I think it is <laughs> I oh, think wow. it's okay. probably I think it's probably only in the in the low to mid 90s right now here um, because it's so early in June. We've been here in July and we've had over 120 degree heat. Um, so this is pretty, pretty nice for, for where we are right now in the San Juan Basin. It's still pretty cool. <laughs> you figured out the right time of year to get to New Mexico for <laughs> dinosaur prospecting. That's right. That's right. We'll, we'll call in from Utah in July and that, that's going to be a lot hotter. So you can ask me that again mm, yeah. in July. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, for sure. Okay, so uh, you mentioned uh, earlier having a big team of scientists from lots of different disciplines on uh, on the paleo team with you there. And you also just mentioned that you had some students with you. So tell us a little bit about the team that you've assembled to go to New Mexico. Well, we have different people who come in and out all summer. As you can imagine, most people can't spend 14 weeks uh, in a row out in the field. Um, but the students, the graduate students in my lab, there are five of them, they will be um, out all summer. One, one is back in the lab right now doing some research because he needs to graduate. Uh, but the other four are out here with me um, for about the whole 14 weeks. And then we have our lab manager. Um, we have various staff from the paleo unit, Lisa Herzog, who's on the call. Um, We'll come out in a couple of weeks and, and help out. And we have postdocs. So these are, um, these are early career researchers. These are um, people who've gotten their PhD but don't yet um, have a faculty job or a curatorship. And they're kind of um, still working on their professional skills and their research. And so we have some postdocs out. And then I will have um, five undergraduates out with me from NC State. I teach a, a summer field class where the undergraduates get to um, come out in the field for a couple of weeks and learn how to do paleontology in the field. So they'll be out in July this year as well. So we have various people coming in and out all summer, which, which is nice because otherwise we'd probably get sick of each other just camping uh, all summer, just us. <laughs> right, right. Gosh, I, I missed the uh, head to the West and dig up dinosaurs class when I was in college. <laughs> yeah, it's a rare one. <laughs> That's pretty cool. So what will 
a successful expedition look like? Well, I always consider it a successful expedition if nobody gets hurt. <laughs> That's kind of there a low bar, but yeah. let's start there. If, ever, if we're all safe and happy and we come back to the museum uh, with some fossils, that's good. Um, but, you know, there's really, we have great luck. Um, we have great luck out here and, and there are always great discoveries that we make every year. And the thing is, it's, it's hard to know, you know, and that's what I love about doing field work is you literally don't know from day to day to hour to hour what you're going to find. Um, and that's, that's what makes it so exciting. That's the discovery part. And so you kind of got to come out here with expectations that you're probably going to find something great, but you can't come out here looking for something in particular, right? Because you're never going to find exactly what you're looking for. You're going to find something else great. And what's it been like putting an expedition together uh, in the sort of pandemic times that we've been in? Oh, it's really, it's really no different. I mean, honestly, it's a huge effort. Um, myself and Lisa, the operations manager and Eric Lund, who's, who's our lab manager, you know, we've probably been working on this summer uh, field expedition for about four months. We have about 30 people wow. coming in and out all summer. We have four vehicles. We have, you know, five base camps. We, we have to deal with about 12 permits from state and federal agencies. Um, you know, so it's a huge logistic time sink to put these things together, but it's our favorite part of what we do. At least it's my favorite part of what I do. And it's such a joy to be out here. So it's worth, it's worth all that time and effort. Excellent. Excellent stuff. Well, uh, questions are rolling in. If you'd like to start taking some audience questions, Lindsay. Sure, that sounds great. All right, so uh, the first one that I've got here comes from Troy. How many people are on the team and where do you find the team members? We talked a little bit about that actually. Yeah, right now we have eight. Uh, we're a small crew, just the lab right now, plus a graduate student from another university who um, wanted to do some field work this summer is out with us. So this is kind of our core team and we'll get up to about um, 14 to 16 in the middle of the summer and then we'll sort of shrink back down. Um, and like I said, it's, it's undergrads, grad students, postdocs, it's staff from the museum. And then we have a few select volunteers who we know really well, who uh, we know will do okay out here. Um, <laughs> the, the ones who can hike around all day with 70 pound packs. Yeah. And those be ready are the to ones. do it the next day. <laughs> <laughs> Easygoing, flexible people are good because it's field work and you never know what, uh, what's going to happen. I heard a story. It might be apocryphal, but that uh, to get on a Lindsay Zano expedition, you had to put on one of these 70 pound backpacks and you had to go up uh, all four flights of stairs inside the museum at least like two or three times, and then they would think about it. <laughs> Maybe if you guys would turn the heat up in the museum, that, that would be a good test, test run. <laughs> <laughs> turn the air conditioner off and then do it. No, we're good, we're good. We, uh, you don't have to be a powerhouse to be out here. We, we, we want everybody to be able to do field work. Uh, so we, we do our best to accommodate everybody's abilities out here, so. Yeah, absolutely. That's what I said. There was no way that that was true. <laughs> Dr. Zano is too nice. Okay, let's see. Uh, Dinosaur Dude writes, this project's goal seems very similar to other papers I've read from Dr. Zano, like the description of C.H. Micarorum and Moros Intrepidus. Yeah, that's all part of the same project. Um, our, my team is working the New Mexico, Utah block of this project, but we have uh, five institutions working across the whole Western U.S., all the way from Montana down to Texas, um, doing various pieces. So the New Mexico, Utah region is where my team is focusing right now. And that, that's all stuff that's coming out of the project. Do you think we'll get another uh, theropod T-Rex ancestor? Out that of, would uh, be out nice. Of this year's expedition. <laughs> that would be great. Set the bar a little higher, why don't you, Chris? <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Well, like like Dinosaur Dude said, 
Uh, you've brought back Siach. We did the Moros Intrepidus announcement uh, two years ago, I think. Yep. Too much fanfare inside the museum. So, I mean, you're setting the bar pretty high for yourself, uh. I feel like. <laughs> Well, we have a few, we actually have some, some more great dinosaurs coming out of that project. We have a new orodromine, which is a, a small planning, eating, burrowing dinosaur that's going to be named. We have a new, uh, very primitive duck dinosaur that we need to name. Um, we have all those really incredible nests that came out of that area too. So, um, so stay tuned in the next year or two, we hope to be able to get um, definitely there's about three more dinosaurs, a turtle, and some nests and stuff that we need to get published out of that ecosystem. So there'll be more coming out soon. Sounds exciting. Okay, uh, Brent writes, Brent has a second grader who wants to know how big your camp is. It's small. Uh, we have two kitchen tents and a couple of tables, a bunch of chairs and a fire pit. And then everybody's sleeping tents, and that's pretty much all we need. Okay. So not uh, there's not a whole tent city going on out there in the desert. Not a whole tent city. One kitchen tent, one equipment tent, and everybody's sleeping tents, and that's about it. All right. Let's see. Herman writes, since not many fossils fluoresce under normal UV light, do lasers allowing you to detect fluorescence in surface fossils help you find them? Oh, well, I mean, we've worked with laser stimulated fluorescence on specimens that we've collected, but the setup is really extreme. And I, I don't know that we could, um, that we could, it, it, it just wouldn't be worth it to like shine lasers across the hill when you can cover so much ground just with your eyes. So I think it's possible that if we had, you know, if, if it were 2300 and I had laser glasses, I could just put on and scan the hillside. Yeah, that probably worked pretty well. But for now, I'm just going to have to use my old eyes uh, to, to spot them the old fashioned way. Spot them the old fashioned way. I guess, I guess paleontology in the lab is adopting some really interesting new techniques to help answer questions. But paleontology in the field is still a hammer, a chisel, and knowing what to look for. This is true. Paleontology in the field hasn't changed very much. We collect more data than we used to. Um, but, you know, people have tried things like, you know, surface scanning and, and we do things like that 3D modeling of quarries and outcrop. And we use satellites a lot. Um, satellite imagery has really, really helped us. But at the end of the day, we find fossils still by getting on the ground and hiking around. So that's still the best way to do it. Nice. All right, uh, let's see. Eight-year-old Miles wants to know, what are some of the new dinosaurs in this region that have been named at this time, or are they all so new that they don't have names? Hey, Miles. So there have been some dinosaurs named from this area that we're in. Um, the Tyrannosaur was named Dynamo Terror. Uh, there was a duckbill dinosaur, Ornatops, that was just named. And in fact, just last month, um, a different research group from here in New Mexico named um, uh, the one of the ceratopsians or horned dinosaurs that's out here, um, Menifee ceratops. So those are some of the dinosaurs that um, live nearby. Um, we're not sure if the, the rocks that we're in right now are exactly the same age and if the fossils we're finding actually belong to those dinosaurs or might belong to some different dinosaurs because there still needs to be a lot of work done out here to figure out exactly where everything is and how old it is. But, um, but you can look up some of those dinosaurs. There you go, Miles. Are there many paleontology teams working in this area? I mean, you sort of hinted that you go places other teams don't, uh, but do you have collaborators that are out there at different times or working nearby? Yeah, there's another team that works uh, in this area that's doing really great work. Um, a scientist, paleontologist named Andrew McDonald and his team, he's the one who's named all the dinosaurs that I've just mentioned. Um, they've been out here for a long time working in a similar area to where we are. Um, and, and then in the area that we're going to be in a couple of weeks, there's um, a, a, a team, Doug Wolf and his team have been naming dinosaurs from that area for a long time. Um, so there's a handful of other people out here, but there's an 
awful lot of outcrop to cover. There's, there's a hundred miles of Menifee formation out here. So um, with just two teams, there'll, there'll be plenty of rock left when I, uh, when I'm 90 years old and someone like Miles is a paleontologist to look for. So don't worry, we, we won't, we won't cover it all. There you go. All right. Uh, let's see. Troy wants to know if you found, or if anyone else has found prehistoric fish in New Mexico. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of fish out here. I found a um, fish scale two days ago, but yep. You find fish scales a lot, mostly gars and, and bony fish. Um, we haven't found any nice fish. We really aren't looking for fish. So we're not really keyed into that. Um, usually if it's, if there's a lot of fish in a place, you might have a good micro fossil site, um, which is something that we are interested in. And it's a place where if you get a lot of fish fossils, often you'll get a lot of um, other fossils from tiny animals like lizards and snakes and small mammals and baby dinosaurs and things. So um, if you're finding fish scales, that's a good indicator. You might have a really nice microvertebrate site. But then what you need to do is you need to collect big bags of the sediment. You need to screen them just like you're panning for gold with water and collect all those microfossils into a concentrate and pick them under the microscope. Um, but that is something we're also looking for out here would be a nice microvertebrate site. All right. Our next user here wants to know how you can get into a profession like this. Um, well, you have to be pretty determined. Um, you have to chase your dream. There are not a lot of jobs for paleontologists uh, in the world, but if you get one, it's the best job there is. So if you're going to be dedicated to it, you want to study both geology and biology, because you can see behind me, you got to understand the rocks and you want to describe ancient life. You have to understand ancient biology and modern biology. Um, so study geology and biology and um, get in it for the long haul and be determined and you'll do just fine. Works for Dr. Lindsay Zano, everybody. Okay, uh, has there been any evidence that dinosaurs were tool users? No, not tool users. I mean, well, okay, let me let me walk that back because living dinosaurs are tool users, right? So you oh, have things like corvids and some really smart dinosaurs that are still with us today that are tool users, but. Um, but those are really relatively big brain dinosaurs. They probably are a lot smarter than most of the dinosaurs that we, uh, that we dig up. You know, dinosaurs back only needed to be as smart as they needed to be. The predators only needed to be a little bit smarter than the prey. And, and um, you definitely had birds back then, but, but bird brains went through a lot of changes as they evolved. And so um, I think it's unlikely that we had any tool using dinosaurs back in the Mesozoic. If we did, they were probably birds. There you go. Good question. Uh, let's see. You've worked in so many places just in the last few years, Montana, Utah, New Mexico. Does any site stand out as a favorite? Yeah, yes. The Must and Touch It of Utah is, is still my favorite. It's been my long, long-term favorite. It was the first project I started on my own. Um, and it's, it's like a second home to me. Um, but I also love going to new places. We started working in Thailand a couple of years ago, and we're starting our first expedition to Mongolia this year. We were supposed to start last year, but we couldn't go, obviously, because of the pandemic. So, so that's going to be fun, too. I do love going to new places as, as well. Oh, wow. Excellent. So many new developments coming out of paleontology all the time. Okay, uh, do you often sketch out sites and specimens or has that mostly been replaced by photography? I still draw, maybe I'm old school, but I still draw specimens in my field notebook. Um, honestly, when you're out here and you're trying to take a picture with your phone and the sun is bright and your phone is black and there's dust everywhere and you think you've got a great picture, but you cannot see at all really what you're taking a picture of and you get back to the lab six months later and you're like, you know, you can't tell the fossil from the rock or whatever. So there's no replacement for taking good field notes and doing good field drawings at the end of the day. So yeah, I still do that. Nice. 
Okay, five-year-old CJ would like to know how many fossils you found this year. Hey, CJ, we've only been out for a week. Um, hmm, I don't know. We probably found like pieces of fossils. We've definitely found over a hundred pieces. Um, we probably found about, I want to say like 30, 35 different bones so far. Not all of them we've collected. Most of them we haven't because they've been too broken up. Um, they've been on the surface for too long and they're too eroded and broken into pieces to be collected. But we have dug up and jacketed a few nice ones. Okay, very nice. Uh, you just said dug up and jacketed. What is jacketed? Jacketed is the way we protect the fossil. We The way we get it safely out of the ground and keep it protected until we can get it to the lab and it can be conserved. So if you just pull a fossil out of the ground, it's just going to break into pieces. Um, so what we do is we bring consolidant with us. So this is like, um, it's kind of like a glue, but it's, it's basically um, dissolved in acetone and it put it on the fossil and the acetone um, evaporates, leaving the consolidant behind to hold all the pieces together. And then we uh, wrap the bone in um, toilet tissue or paper towels. We wet it and make sure it sticks in every little crack. And then we wrap it either with um, pre-made plaster bandages like they use if you break your leg or your arm, they come already embedded with plaster, and, but they're very small and they're very weak. So you can only use those on small bones. And then if we have big bones, we make big vats of um, hydrocal um, plaster. We mix it up with water in the field until it's wet and we dunk um, burlap bandages in it. And then we wrap the burlap bandages around the fossil and we let it set or cure. And it becomes like a very hard casing um, and then we flip it over and we do the other side. And then we have the entire bone encased in sediment, encased in this plaster. Um, and then it can stay with the team, you know, for the full 14 weeks without breaking up until we get to drive it back to the museum. All right. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let's see. Jennifer's eight-year-old would like to know if there's a way to figure out what colors dinosaurs were. Oh, that's a good question. Um, we do... We do have some good new techniques for looking at dinosaur color, but it's mostly for telling whether dinosaurs had dark pigments like blacks and browns or white or were iridescent. Um, these are things called melanosomes. So these are like pigment cells in the body. And sometimes we um, get them preserved, especially in feather or skin when it becomes fossilized. The problem is that a lot of animals use pigments that are colored, like reds and yellows, that they get from eating from the environment or they make in their bodies from their food. And we haven't really figured out a way to um, identify those kinds of pigments in dinosaurs. So it's really hard to tell if a dinosaur um, was red or green or blue or yellow, or orange, because uh, we haven't really developed good ways for for determining that yet, but people have started doing it with dinosaur eggs and they've been able to figure out which pigments are preserved in some of the dinosaur eggs. So for example, we know that some dinosaur eggs were blue green, just like um, the living dinosaur, the emus eggs. And we haven't really been able to do that so much for feathers or skin just yet, but I think that we probably will. It's just a matter of time. This is one area of paleontology where it's changing really quickly and new scientists are coming along with new techniques and collaborating with, with people and figuring this stuff out. So it's kind of the next phase of paleontology is figuring out things like paleo color. Excellent, thank you. And uh, let's see here, probably the last couple of ones we've got time for, I think you maybe mentioned this, how do you get to your sites? Yeah, hiking, old-fashioned hiking up these slippery slopes. It's, uh, I wish we had a trolley or something or um, one of those hovercrafts. That's what I've always wanted. One of those hovercrafts you lay and you can just kind of like hover over the hills or paragliders or something. There's a lot of things that I wish for when I'm sitting on a hillside, helicopters, paragliders, whatever. But mostly I just have to hike back down the hill at the end of the day. <laughs> I mean, I, I've seen video of you taking helicopter rides out of the hills. 
but those are pretty uh, particular circumstances, I think. Yeah, unfortunately, very rare, very fun, but very rare. So earlier in the show, we were talking about ecosystems uh, and these past climates. And there's a question here, were there insects like ladybugs or dragonflies in dinosaur times? Yeah, yeah, there were definitely insects like dragonflies and beetles and, and things like that, even ticks and, and mites and things that lived on dinosaur feathers. And um, we know a lot about insects from uh, when we get very fine lake deposits. You have to have very fine sediments to preserve something like an insect where you get very, very fine clays. Um, and those are kind of rare and isolated. Um, and also amber, we get a lot of insects from, from amber. So we know a lot about what kinds of insects were living around dinosaur times from that. Last question, it just popped up, but I think it's fun. Do you ever use drones? Uh, we use drones to do uh, photogrammetry of sites and outcrop. So um, there's some amazing, talented people at the museum who fly drones, and sometimes they'll come out with us and and um, be able to take pictures of the outcrop and the quarries and then make 3D models of those when we get back so we can better understand how our sites are related in space to one another or exactly how the bones were in the ground in the quarry before they were removed. Excellent, excellent stuff. Lindsay, thank you so much for, for zooming in with us from all the way out there in New Mexico in the field. Yeah, it's been great. Uh, thanks for having me, Chris. And thanks for all the great questions, everybody. Excellent work, everybody. Those were fantastic questions. Uh, folks, if you wanna learn more or if you didn't get your question answered, some of the questions that I see here that we didn't get to, you can come back Watch this video again. We got to a lot of great topics in the conversation with Dr. Lindsay Zano. We'll be back here again for another episode of Science Tonight next Thursday at 7. But if dinosaurs and paleontology is really your thing, we're going to be checking in with Dr. Zano and her team again in July and in August as they continue their long expedition. So uh, July 20th and then August 4th, both of those during the day at noon. Make sure that you visit naturalsciences.org. Check out the events calendar to find those live video calls from the dinosaur digs. And uh, we'll get updates and see how things are going. Yeah, Lindsay, everybody again, can follow us ahead. on Twitter, Chris. I was just going to say, we're on Twitter. We're tweeting every time we get to the top of the hill and get a little one bar signal. Um, so if people want to follow along with what we're finding, you can find us um, on Twitter at Expedition Live, and we're also on Instagram. I'm a little, I'm not so great at Instagram yet. I'm still learning, so maybe a little less on the update department, but um, definitely follow us on Twitter and see, see what we're up to in between the live streams, so. Excellent, and uh, folks, on that same note, you can follow the museum on social at Natural Sciences on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, where you're likely to see uh, updates as uh, as we see them and can reshare them from from Dr. Zana. So, everybody, hey, thanks for tuning in, Lindsay. Uh, stay safe out there. We'll, we we want to see you back at the museum again. <laughs> thanks, Chris. We'll do. We'll talk to you soon. And good luck. Talk soon. Bye, Lindsay. Bye. And everybody, hey, thanks for tuning in to this episode of Science Tonight. Uh, we will be here again next week. Like I said, naturalsciences.org, all the great stuff is there. And take care, stay safe, keep your community safe. Good night, everybody.